Yep. All right. Welcome, everybody, to uh, the Inspirited Networks Class B. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about the secrets uh, of the grave. So before we begin anything, we'll start with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity that we could come together to study your word. We pray that you would be with us and dwell with us as we open up these truths within your scriptures. Help us, Lord, to have clarity and understanding. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So um, death is one of the most difficult subjects um, for people to talk about. It's something that uh, because all human beings live, uh, we all um, kind of look forward to this event, not look forward to it in a positive way usually, but we are usually afraid of this um, of this event and uh, in many cases just dread it. Um, but the Bible has a lot to say about death, and um, death is something that's feared by so many. I mean, if you really think about it, um, it, it's one of the greatest fears that people have. And sometimes it can be a healthy fear. Other times it can be an unhealthy fear, uh, meaning that, you know, if we're cautious with our lives and the, with the things that we do so as to avoid death, obviously that's a good thing. But um, when we fear it to the point where um, we think that there's no hope, um, then that's, a, that's something different. Um, but the Bible gives us some information that helps us to know that we don't have to be afraid of death and to think of it as a hopeless situation, at least not if we are in Christ, because with Christ we have hope that even death can't um, overshadow. So uh, death just might be one of the most misunderstood subjects of today. Uh, to many, it's, it's enshrouded in mystery, and it evokes dreaded feelings of, of fear, uncertainty, and even hopelessness. Others believe that there are uh, deceased ones or loved ones are not dead at all, but instead live with them uh, or, or in other realms. Uh, others believe that, or, or they're confused about the relationship between the body, the spirit, and the soul. Um, but does it really make a difference what you believe? And the answer to that question is, of course it does, absolutely. Because what you believe about the dead will have a profound impact on what happens to you in the end time. And there's no room for guessing. Um, so, in this study, we're going to tell you exactly what God says about this subject. So my first question for the night, or for the afternoon, depending on where you're from, uh, is how did we get here in the first place? So in order to understand death, we have to first understand life. How did we get here? Any thoughts out there? What was the question? How did we get here in the first place? Well, God created us. That's right. And and how did he do that? He took the elements of the earth and made our bodies and blew the breath of life in us. That's right. All right. So we're going to look specifically at uh, Genesis chapter 2 and uh, go into more precise detail. So Genesis chapter 2 and specifically looking at verse 7. And it says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Amen. So God made us from dust in the beginning. That's what man is made of. And then um, after creating our bodies with the dust of the ground, he breathes into our nostrils the breath of life. And that's how man became a living soul. So a living soul is not something that God put within the human being, but it's something that the human being became once God put together the breath and also the created body. So the combination of the created body and the breath are what make a living soul. So then the question becomes, okay, well, what happens when, when a person dies? Then what? 
How does that affect our uh, equation? Turns to the ground. And God separates again the breath and the body. The body disintegrates to the ground, decomposes, and then God takes the breath and kind of like freezes it into time. Okay. Let's take a look at Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 7. It says, Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, right, just like you said, and the spirit shall return unto God who gave it. Now, a lot of people actually misinterpret this text because when they see the word spirit, they're thinking that there must have been an internal spirit, uh, as in a spiritual being that lived inside of the person that then returns to God that gave it to that person. But scripture, if you look closely, and especially if you look at the original language, the word that's used for spirit there is actually ruach. And ruach has several meanings. It can mean a spirit is in a spiritual being, like an angel, for example. It can mean wind, or it can mean breath, as in what we breathe. So in this context, the, the, the context is pretty clear that it was the breath that returns to God who gave it not a spiritual being or a spiritual force of some kind. So exactly. when a person dies, the dust returns to the ground, and then the breath that God gave in the beginning returns to him. So if we look at Genesis 2-7 and just kind of compare that, it wasn't a spirit that God gave man or breathed, or breathed into his nostrils, but rather it was the breath of life. And so that, that breath of life is what returns to God. All right. Third question. What is the spirit that returns to God at death? We kind of just talked about that, but what do you think? What's the spirit that returns to God? It's the uh, conscious, uh, uh, you know, our, our breath. Which is... Hmm. We're going to take a look at a couple of texts. Uh, if we look at James chapter 2, verse 26, the Bible tells us the body without the spirit is dead. And again, the word used for spirit there uh, can also mean breath. And uh, it actually says that in the uh, margin, if you have a marginal Bible. Then you have Job chapter 27, verse 3, which says the spirit of God um, has given me life. Right? Let me just grab the text again. Uh, Job chapter 20, sorry, Job chapter 3. Or actually 27, rather, verse 3. Job 27 and verse 3. It says, all the while my breath is in me, the spirit of God is in my nostrils. Now, hold on a second. When the spirit of God comes on a person, does he only go into a person's nostrils? An interesting question, because this specifically says the spirit of God is in my nostrils. If the spirit of God is going to reside within a person, is he going to reside only in that person's nose? Well, definitely not. The Spirit of God, uh, you know, resides in a person. If any particular part would be in the person's heart. But um, the Holy Spirit resides within the whole person, not just within the person's nose. Um, so if we... Look at that word spirit again in Job 27 and verse 3. You're going to notice that it's that same word that we keep talking about that keeps popping up, ruach. And so when we look at the context that this ruach of God is in my nostrils, is he talking about a spirit as in a spiritual being residing in his nostrils, or is he talking about breath? It's the breath. So now when we go back to Genesis 2-7, just to double check, it says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. So what did God 
in creation put into man's nostrils. He put into man's nostrils the breath of life. He didn't put in a spirit. He didn't put in a, a spiritual being. He didn't put in wind. He put in the breath. So the only thing that resides within a person's nostrils is the breath that God gave them. So now when we look at Job 27, verse 3, and we see all the while my breath is in me, the ruach of God is in my nostrils, it's not talking about the spirit of God as in the Holy Spirit or as in a spiritual being, but it's talking about the, the breath of God is in my nostrils. So one of the most common reasons why people misunderstand the state of the dead is because of misinterpretations of the word ruach. When people see that word ruach in the original and always translate it to mean spirit, the understanding of some texts become very skewed and, and, uh, and misunderstood because of how people interpret that word. But when you look at the context, as we just did, you're going to see that where the word spirit sometimes is in Scripture, it would better be interpreted um, <clears throat> breath. And in some translations, it will actually say breath. So some translations will have it correct, whereas others will put spirit, where um, spirit would be, would be better um, translated breath. But hopefully now it's clear that it's not a spirit that God put in our nostrils, but rather his breath. So the next question is, what is a soul? Sorry, say again. Next question is, what is a soul? See, this is another one of those confusing questions um, that is a reason why so many people have trouble interpreting um, these texts. If we look at Genesis 2-7, we have our answer again. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. He breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and then man became a living soul. So the word that's used or translated soul there in Genesis 2-7 uh, is, actually comes from the Hebrew word nafesh. Nefesh does not mean um, a spiritual entity that lives within, within a person. Nefesh simply means a living being, a living person, or a living thing. So in Genesis 2-7, where it says, and man became a living soul, you could also translate that, and man became a living being, or a living person. So a nefesh is just the living modalities, the living functions, all the things that make a person a person. So simply put, a soul is just a living being. And it's always a combination of two things, the body and the breath. A soul cannot exist unless a body and breath are combined. So God's word teaches that we don't have souls, we are souls. When you, look inside, when you look into a mirror, you're looking at a soul because it's a combination of breath and body. If you remove the breath from the body, then you're looking at just a, a corpse, just a body. If you look at just the breath, you're looking at just the breath. But when you look at both of them together, you're looking at a living person. All right. Next question. Do souls die? Because many different churches out there are teaching, and not even just churches, but actually different religions out there are teaching that uh, when a person dies, their soul goes to heaven or their soul, um, <clears throat> you know, goes to hell. Some people teach that the soul reincarnates itself into a new body. But we just established that a soul ceases to, um, you know, to be a soul when you remove any part of the equation. If you remove the breath, 
you no longer have a soul. You just have a corpse. If you remove the body, you no longer have a soul. You just have the breath. So although many popular beliefs out there are teaching that the soul continues on even after death, we have to ask the question, is it possible for a soul to die? Is it possible for a soul to die? I'll give you guys a hint. Take a look at Ezekiel chapter 18 and verse 20. Uh, Jose, would you like to grab it? Ezekiel. Uh, you're kind of breaking up, so I'm not sure if you heard me or not. Yeah, what was the uh, the chapter again? Oh, it's Ezekiel chapter 18 and verse 20. All right, I'm looking up. Ezekiel 18, verse 20, right? That. The soul who sins shall die. The son shall not bear the guilt of the father, nor the father. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself. There you go. Okay. Uh, hold on one second. Okay. So, according to the Bible, it specifically states the soul that sins shall die. So, in other words, this popular belief out there that tells people that um, a soul can't die, that it goes on to live after you die, that it can reincarnate, or that it can do all these different things, is actually unbiblical. All right? Because according to the Bible, the soul, if a soul sins, if a person sins, they will die. Um, when we look at Revelation 16 and verse 3, it tells us that every living soul died in the sea. So according to the Bible, the soul can definitely die. And that makes a whole lot of sense when we look at um, the other texts that, that, that talk about what a soul is. If a soul is just a living person and a living person can die, then a soul can definitely die. But a lot of times what's happening in today in, in modern Christianity and in many other religions is that um, people are misinterpreting what the Bible means when it says soul. Again, a soul is not just a, a, a person, uh, sorry, it's not just a, 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 um, a spirit or a force that lives inside of a person, but the soul is the entire person. And it's really difficult for people to get that concept because we've been educated to do otherwise. If we look at all the popular TV shows out there and, you know, like the Harry Potters and we look at, um, you know, all of the different New Age movies that are out there, it's difficult for people to understand the concept of the soul in the biblical sense because they've already been educated in the worldly sense to think a certain way about what the soul is. Hold on one second. Another person's calling in. Okay. Uh, can you hear us okay? Hello? Okay, great. Just making sure you can hear us okay. Yes, I am. So we were talking about um, the concept of, of the soul and how much of the modern world actually misunderstands what the Bible means when it says soul. So, um, you know, I know I've repeated it a bunch of times, but I'm going to say it again. Um, a soul 
It's just a combination of the breath and the body. Uh, but the modern world uh, and much of the new age, um, you know, teaches that the soul is a spiritual force of some kind that lives within a person and that that thing can be reincarnated or that that thing goes on after you die to go to either to heaven or hell. Um, and, you know, different religions have different ideas, that, but generally follow these same guidelines, and they believe that the soul is immortal. But the biblical concept of the soul is very, very different. In fact, um, the word that's used for soul in the Bible is the word nefesh, which simply means a living person. It does not mean this immortal entity or force that, uh, you know, continues on uh, whether a person dies or not or gets reincarnated or, or what have you. Those are all unbiblical concepts. Yeah. When we look at the Bible, the Bible teaches that this okay. idea of the immortal soul that many people believe in doesn't exist. Uh, and this is actually a common error that's, that's difficult for people to understand because of how we've been educated through the film, through uh, music, through TV shows, and through many different other forms of media uh, to believe that this concept of the soul is something that is immortal and something that no matter what you do, it goes on living. The belief in the soul has led many to believe that if a person is lost, and this is a belief of, Christian, of, of many in Christianity, if a person is lost, then their soul is going to burn forever and ever and ever in hell because if the soul can't die and it continues to burn and it never leaves uh, the state of burning, then God will burn that individual forever and ever and ever. But that's a false doctrine and a false teaching because the, the, the soul is not immortal. Um, many people believe that there are such things as ghosts or, you know, um, uh, people that continue to haunt their families or haunt houses or haunt uh, places after they are already dead because they're uncontent uh, with something that happened in their life. And so therefore, because they have no rest, they continue to bother and pester people even after the person has died because their soul is still alive and in the form of a ghost and comes to haunt people. But if you understand that the soul dies when the breath uh, is removed from the body, and that there is no such thing as an immortal soul, then you know that there can be no such thing as ghosts, according to the Bible. So this nope. belief of, of the... Go ahead, I'm sorry. Say that, that it, that's true. Is that there's no um, biblical back. That's right. This belief in the immortal soul has led to a concept that bridges Christianity uh, and many other different types of, of religions out there. And this belief is called spiritualism. Spiritualism is the belief, uh, or one of the beliefs of spiritualism at least, is, is this belief in the immortal soul. And that's where people get the concepts of ghosts, uh, reincarnation, and uh, you know all these different things. They believe that if the soul can't die, and what happens to it after, it, after, after the individual is gone, uh, it must either reincarnate itself or it must be in the form of a ghost or maybe it goes up to heaven. But the Bible teaches that the, when, when the individual dies, the soul dies because the, the soul is the individual. It's the nefesh, the living person. So when you separate breath or the body, the soul dies. Just like Ezekiel 18, 20 says, the soul that sits can't die. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and uh, move forward. When we look at um, Job chapter 4 and verse 7, uh, it says, Remember, I pray thee, Whoever perished being innocent, or where were the righteous cut off? So according to Job, he seems to believe that a person is mortal. 
Bring my bag, I'm gonna... Sorry, say again? Hello? Yes, go ahead. Okay, I was just trying to get my Bible. Go ahead, whenever you're ready. That's Job. Yeah, we just read uh, Job chapter 4 and verse Mm -hmm. um, 17. Okay, all right. I actually read uh, verse 7 by mistake. But uh, 17 says, Shall mortal man be more just than God? Shall a man be more pure than his maker? But notice in the beginning part of that text, it tells us that um, mortal man uh, isn't more just than God. And it, notice it, it, it emphasizes that man is mortal. And the other text that I read in verse 7 talks about how um, – you know, individuals can uh, can be perished or cut off, uh, but both suggest that an individual can uh, can in fact die. Uh, the next one is First Timothy chapter six, verse fifteen and sixteen. Whoever has it can read it. So, if someone can read for me, First Timothy chapter six, verse fifteen and sixteen. First Timothy chapter six. Verse 15 and 16. Okay. Um, baby, let me read, okay? Sure, go for it. Okay. Um, that's First Timothy 6, 15 and 16, you said? Uh, First Timothy mm-hmm. chapter 6. Yes. Um, verses... Um, 15 and 16. Okay, it's, it reads, which in his times he shall show who is the blessed and only potent, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man has seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. That's in the very day. Yeah. All right. So, according to Timothy, only God is immortal. Mm-hmm. Nobody else has immortality other than God. The rest of us are dependent on God to have eternal life. But the Father has eternal life within himself. So the concept of undying immortal soul goes against the Bible, which teaches that the soul is subject to death. So then the next logical question would be, do good people go to heaven when they die? What are your thoughts? Do good people go to heaven when they die? It's kind of a trick question. Okay? Comment just came in. No, no, they don't. That's right. So, then the majority of the Christian world must have it wrong because many are teaching that when an individual dies, I mean, I've gone to funerals where people have said, okay, you know, so-and-so is smiling down on us right now. You know, you watch TV shows. And, uh, you know, I like to watch the cooking channel. And usually when there's a person who's competing, um, they ask them, okay, well, why did you decide to compete? And sometimes there are relatives in an individual's family that have inspired them to want to go on the show and want to cook and want to prove themselves. And when they talk about these relatives or these friends, these loved ones, they will usually say, you know, so-and-so is no longer here with us, but I know that they're looking down and right now they're smiling. Well, if individuals don't go to heaven when they die, if there's no such thing as an immortal soul, then that's impossible. Let's take a look at John chapter 5, verse 28 and 29. John chapter 5. Verse 28 and 29. 
And it says, Marvel not at this. So in other words, Jesus is saying, I don't want you to guys, I don't want you guys to be surprised by this. For the hour is coming in the which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice and shall come forth, they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. So according to Jesus, there is life after death but not in the way that the majority of the Christian world and the um, other religious world think about it. I'll give you another example before I go back to that one. We're going to look at Acts chapter 2, verse 29, and then skip down to verse 34. Acts chapter 2. And we're going to start with verse 29, and then we're going to skip down to verse 34. And it says, Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, talking about King David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulchre is with us unto this day. So according to uh, this individual, I believe it's um, Peter here speaking, because it's Acts chapter 2. According to Peter... He understood that David is dead, he's buried, and his tomb was with them even to that point. So according to, to, to Peter, where was David? In the grave. Then you look at verse 34. For David is not ascended into the heavens, but he saith himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand until I make thy foes thy footstool. So according to uh, Peter, David, even though he was uh, a person who will be saved, did not ascend into the heaven, but was dead and in the ground. So Peter understood that the dead don't go directly to heaven. And mind you, he's speaking in the book of Acts. This is after the resurrection. But the dead are waiting for the resurrection of the just, and the resurrection of the unjust, the resurrection of life, and the resurrection of damnation. Job chapter 17, verse 13 tells us, if I wait, the grave is mine house. So all these individuals had the understanding that when people die, they don't go to heaven, they don't go anywhere, they stay in the grave, and they await the resurrection. Now, for those people who might be new and who might not understand the difference between a resurrection and a person going immediately to heaven when they die, I want to kind of make that clear. Jesus, as we read in John chapter 5, verse 28 and 29, taught that there would be a resurrection. People would come out of the grave either to the resurrection of life or to the resurrection of damnation. Now, a resurrection is when Jesus calls that person out of the grave much like he did Lazarus, and the person uh, has the breath returned to the body, and that person continues to live and be restored as a living, functioning human being. So the Bible doesn't teach that an individual dies and then takes on some kind of spiritual form and continues to live in some kind of afterlife, but rather the Bible promises a resurrection, a return of the breath to the body, and then uh, the, the body uh, bec uh, becomes, again, a living soul, and that individual will continue to live. However, uh, we read in Corinthians and, and uh, a few other texts of the Bible that uh, those who are brought up in the resurrection of life will receive a new glorified spiritual body, but this spiritual body won't be like a ghost form, uh, like many assume, but rather will be a body much like uh, you know, the human body in the sense that uh, it's physical, it, it, it can be touched, it can be handled. How do we know that? Well, let's take a look at what happened when Jesus came back from the grave. Because when Jesus resurrected, uh, we know that our resurrection is going to be just like his resurrection. So I want to take us to um, the book of Luke. So, 
The same resurrection that Jesus experienced is the resurrection that human beings are promised. Uh, this is what eternal life is going to be like. So if we take a look at uh, Luke chapter 24, and we see how Jesus was resurrected, we can understand something about how people will be resurrected when Jesus comes again. So we're going to start with verse, um, I want to start a little bit earlier. Let's start with verse uh, 36. And as they thus spake, this is the disciples, they're all in this room, and they're speaking, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them, and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. But they were terrified and affrighted and supposed that they had seen a spirit. So these guys didn't think it was really Jesus at first. They thought it must have been some kind of ghost. It must have been some kind of, of, uh, of spirit that was there to torment them. And he said they unto them, with the, uh, local... They brainwashed with what? With the uh, popular beliefs that we have today. That's right. And why were they brainwashed? Because that was the norm. That was what people believed. New Age believes going around. Right. The reason why is because, remember, that the uh, Jews had gone into captivity to the Babylonians as a result of their sin. And uh, after the Babylonian Empire fell to the Medes and the Persians, uh, they were released um, by uh, Artaxerxes. Uh, and then soon after that, you had the Grecian Empire, in which you had the Hellenistic period, and then eventually the, uh, the Romans conquered and uh, became the Fourth World Empire. So because they were under the influence of all these world empires, they began to adopt and to pick up secular beliefs. So that's why there are so many people out there that believe in the immortality of the soul, because they pick up these um, you know, unbiblical Hellenistic tendencies that were popular beliefs of the time, although they did not agree with Scripture. All right. Yeah. So that's the reason why this belief was, has been so popular, even though it's not biblical. Now, when we look at um, Luke chapter 24 again, they thought that it wasn't really Jesus. It must have been some kind of spirit. And Jesus says to them, why are you troubled and why do these thoughts arise in your heart? Behold my hands and my feet that it is I myself handle me and see for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as ye see me have. So when Jesus resurrected, did he have flesh and bones? Yes, he did. But he goes even further than that. And when he had spoken, thus spoken, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they yet believed not for joy and wondered, he said unto them, have ye any meat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish and a, and of a, a, a honeycomb. And he took it and did eat before them. And he said unto them, these are the words which I spake to you while I was yet with you that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. So Jesus was able to take food and actually eat and digest it, something that a spirit couldn't do. And it was understood that a spirit wouldn't be able to do this. So when Jesus resurrected, he wasn't in this ghost-like form. He was resurrected in a physical body. So that tells us that, uh, now let's go to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Amen. And uh, I'm going to look at uh, verse 53 here. Give me one moment to grab it. Okay. I'm actually going to start with uh, a verse earlier. Um, we're going to go actually two verses earlier. We'll go to uh, verse 51. It says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. Now, remember that in Scripture, we'll, we'll talk about this a little, bit, uh, a little bit later also, but Scripture refers to death as a sleep often. So that's, that kind of explains why when Jesus talked about death uh, on several occasions, he referred to it as a sleep. So when uh, his friend Lazarus had died and they said, okay, are we going to go see Lazarus now? He says, oh, uh, Lazarus is sleeping. And the disciples meant that he was literally taking a nap. But he said, no, no, Lazarus is dead. And so Jesus 
used the term sleep to refer to uh, death on many occasions. And that tradition is continued here by Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So he says, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall all be changed. So in the resurrection, the dead are going to be raised up incorruptible and changed. Then he goes on to say, for this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. So according to the Bible, we are going to receive... um, new, better bodies, but these bodies will still be physical bodies. They're not going to be ghost-like bodies. And these will be incorruptible bodies uh, that are immortal as opposed to the frail, uh, sin-sick, and uh, corrupted bodies that we have now. So in that sense, we'll have a new spiritual body, but not in the sense that we'll be these, you know, ghost-like figures. Okay, so going back to this topic of uh, what happens when a person dies, how much does a person know or comprehend once they die? So it's before the resurrection. um, After a person has died, so you're in that in-between state. How much do you know? Nothing. Nothing. Hmm. So does that mean that uh, if a person, um, you know, has a loved one that really, really loves them, that uh, when they go to the grave and they talk to them, can, can that person hear them? Not at all. Not at all. Or how about if a person makes an accomplishment, they graduate high school, they fulfill some type of promise that they've always had, um, can that person look down on them and smile at them? Can that person know or have knowledge that you have accomplished this great path that you promised the individual before they died that they would do? Can that person be aware of it? Nope. Answer just came in. No, they can't. Yes. Um, So let's take a look at uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 9. We're going to look at verses 5, 6, and then skip down to 10. Ecclesiastes chapter 9. And we're going to start with verse 5. For the living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything. Neither have they any more a reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Also, their love and their hatred and their envy is now perished. Neither have they any more a portion forever in anything that is done under the sun. Skipping down to verse 10. Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. For there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave whither thou goest. Wow. So that gives us some insight to a lot of things here. Because according to the Bible, the dead have no knowledge or any partaking of anything in life once they are dead. What's particularly interesting is that most times when you have uh, stories of of spirits, if you watch TV, um, the spirits always linger around because they're upset and angry. But according to the Bible here, it says specifically that their love, their hatred, and their envy is now perished. So if a, if, if a uh, individual's love, envy, and hatred are all perished at death, how can a spirit continue to live after the individual has died because it's angry, has jealousy or hatred, or is so in love that they can't part with the person that they love while alive? According to the Bible, all these things are, are now perished. 
so that a, a, a dead person cannot experience love, hatred, envy, or any of these feelings. So if it's not the person that's there, then what is it? That's the tricky question. Let's go to another text before I answer it. We're going to look at Psalm 115 and verse 17. Can someone read it? Psalm 115, verse 17. Okay. Answer just came into my question before. It says uh, demons, and that's exactly right. But we're going to talk about why in a minute. Uh, so can someone read Psalm 115 and verse 17? Okay, it reads, uh, The dead praise not the Lord, neither any that go down into silence. Hmm. So you would think that if it's true that the soul lives on after a person dies and goes to heaven, that obviously they would praise the Lord. You would think. But according to the Bible, the dead don't praise the Lord. This shows us that when a person dies, they're not going immediately to heaven where they would praise the Lord. I mean, if you were going to die and you're, and you, let's, let's take, let's assume that the belief in the immortality of the soul was true just for a second. If you died and you went to heaven, wouldn't you praise God? I mean, I would. But yet here in Psalm 115 verse 17, according to, uh, to David, he says the dead don't praise the Lord. Now, when we take that under consideration, it shows us clearly that this idea that people live on after they die is false. If the dead don't praise the Lord, it's because they're still in the grave. They can't praise the Lord because they're not alive. Only the living can praise the Lord. And it falls in line with what Ecclesiastes had to say, because our individual's love, ability to love, to have hate, to have envy, are all perished. All their thoughts and their feelings are perished. Their memories are gone. There's no knowledge, no wisdom in the grave where a person goes. So if they don't have knowledge of anything, They can't communicate or do anything else. So then, back to the question that I asked earlier, if these things are all impossible for a dead person to do, then how come we have all these stories about ghosts or people being haunted or loved ones returning from the grave and uh, communicating with those who they left behind? Because clearly, according to Scripture, That's impossible. The dead aren't able to do anything. They don't even have memory. Sorry, go ahead. Those are deceiving spirits. About the time will be deceiving people. Aha! There you go. Demons, fallen angels. Let's take a look at some scripture. Working for the devil. Mm -hmm. Let's take a look at some scripture. Um, The first one I'm going to bring up, uh, I believe, is in Matthew 24. Um, actually, you know, I'm going to look at uh, the one from Mark. I'm going to, I'm going to grab it from Mark chapter uh, 13. 
Now, notice what Jesus says here. This is talking about last day events. And he says, and except that the Lord had shortened those days, no flesh should be saved. But for the elect's sake, whom he hath chosen, he hath shortened the days. And then if any man shall say to you, lo, here is Christ, or lo, there, believe him not. So Jesus predicted that in the last days there would be individuals who tried to impersonate him so as to deceive people. And then in verse 22, he says, for false Christ, false prophet, shall rise and shall show signs and wonders to seduce, if it were possible, even the elect. But take heed, behold, I have before told you all things. So Jesus predicted that demons would produce miracles and signs and wonders to seduce or deceive as many people as they possibly can. And that in doing so, they would bring about false Christ and false prophets that have these abilities to do miracles. This is pretty much the biblical definition of spiritualism. And if we look around us, we're seeing it today. But I want to take us to another text. We're going to go to, I believe, Revelation. Uh, actually, you know what? Before Revelation, I want to grab uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1. It says here, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, talking about the Holy Spirit, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Now I'll go to uh, the text in Revelation chapter 16. Um, And it says, and I saw three unclean spirits, like frogs, come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils doing what? Working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. So according to the Bible, um, spirits will be able to work miracles and deceive People in the last days, and if it were possible, these miracles and these signs and these wonders would be so great that it would deceive even the elect. And that brings us to the story of Samuel, because Samuel um, was a prophet. Well, actually, Samuel and King Saul um, uh, is the story of, of Samuel and King Saul. Samuel was the prophet, and King Saul was rebellious, and Saul didn't listen um, to the instruction that, that, uh, that Samuel had given him. So eventually, Samuel tells him that the kingdom is going to be given to someone else. And we know the story of David and how he came to be the king of Israel. Now, just before Saul dies, and Samuel had already been dead, Saul doesn't get any word from the Lord anymore. He's not able to hear anything from God because he had rejected God by not listening. So instead, he goes to the witch of Endor, and he asks the witch to conjure up Samuel. Now, what does the Bible say about conjuring up the dead? Do not seek to be deceived. Hmm? Well, let's take a look at a couple of texts. You got Leviticus chapter 20, verse 27. It says, a man also or a woman that hath a familiar spirit or that is a wizard shall surely be put to death they shall stone them with stones. Their blood shall be upon them. So does it sound like the Bible is favorable about conjuring up the dead? You 
I'm going to look at a few other ones. Uh, you got Isaiah chapter 19 and verse 3. Uh, God says here, and the spirit of Egypt shall fail in the midst thereof. I will destroy the counsel thereof, and they shall seek to the, to the idols and to the charmers and to them that have familiar spirits and to the wizards. And the Egyptians will I give over to the, will I give over into the hand of the cruel, uh, and a fierce king shall rule over them, saith the Lord, the Lord of hosts. And by the way, if you guys want to look more into the story of Saul uh, and when he's speaking to the familiar spirit, you're going to be looking at uh, 1 Samuel chapter uh, 28. That's where the, uh, the story is recorded. Um, the last text I'm going to give you is... Uh, Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 19. And it says here, And when they shall say unto you, Seek unto them that have familiar spirits, and unto wizards that peep and that mutter, should not a people seek unto their God, for the living to the dead? To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. So according to um, the Bible here, it's suggesting that these individuals who claim the ability to contact the dead or to speak to the dead are basically false. And that individuals should not be looking to familiar spirits, Wizards, people who mutter, people who do incantations or chanters, or etc., but that they should seek God for whatever they want to know. So the Bible is very clear about that. Now, if these spirits aren't really spirits, and devils are going out to deceive the world, and clearly these are demons that people are contacting that are posing as individuals whom they love and whom they care about. Now, a lot of people feel like, oh, well, you know, what if the message is positive? You know, the devil wouldn't tell us anything positive. So, you know, if, if, if my loved one comes back from the grave and tells me something positive, you know, do good in school or great job, I'm so proud of you, how could that possibly be of the devil? If you think about it, if it wasn't, if it was entirely a negative message, nobody would ever accept it. And that's why they call it deception. Deception can only be deception when it's perceived as something positive, but underlying it, there's something negative. Otherwise, it wouldn't be deception. People think that Satan is going to come out in a red jumpsuit and say, hey, I'm the devil. Let's do some bad stuff. Are you guys with me? And that's not how it works. Deception works very underhanded, almost imperceptible. So we often don't see it coming. And that's how Satan works, posing as people's loved ones so that he can gain their confidence. You see, when he first tries to deceive a person, he's not going to come right out necessarily with uh, some type of false teaching or false doctrine right away. First, he wants to get your confidence. And that's why when many people talk about being visited by dead relatives or dead loved ones, it's often a positive experience. Because if it wasn't positive, you wouldn't have any confidence in it. Now, would you? But then once he gains your confidence, he's able to draw you away from the law and from the testimony. So what does a person do when they're not really grounded in their faith or in their belief in the Bible and someone says, I'm back from the grave. The Lord has told me to tell you that you have to do such and such. 
That's right. The devil, yeah, uh, Marvel Nemesis, where Satan has transformed himself into an angel of light. That's right. And I like the comment that's here. Um, deception equals 99.9% truth For our friend. and 0. Uh, and, and 0.01% error, which makes it very hard to discern. Yes, that's true. And so that's why the modern world, to a People great extent, the media deceived everyone, thinking that they're gonna see somebody with two horns coming in. Mm-hmm. Exactly, and that's why the modern world is largely de- deceived by spiritualism in these last last days. Just as just as, as Jesus predicted would happen, he said that almost the whole world, if it were possible, even the very elect would be deceived. Because these demons are able to impersonate, and think about it, they've been around for 6,000 years. They don't die. So if they've been around for 6,000 years, they know all your relatives and your friends. And so they're able to take accurate um, depictions of them and to impersonate them perfectly, saying all the things that they would have said to deceive as many people as they want. And because the modern world does not know the truth about what happens when you die, and they all believe in the immortality of the soul, spiritualism has been very um, successful. So much so that people disregard what's in the Bible if they even read it. And they take on the belief that these spiritual beings who they think are their loved ones or friends tell them that they should believe. In some uh, religions, they, people believe that you can, they, they believe in ancestor worship where a person can pray to their ancestor and receive help. So now if I need to pass my test or if I need protection, I'm going to pray to my ancestor to help me and to guide me. when I need guidance, when I'm trying to figure out where I should go or who I should marry or what I should do, I'm going to go to a seance so that I can conjure up my dead loved one to ask their, their, uh, their opinion on what I should do. And now, spiritualism is becoming so prevalent that it's even in the cartoons, in the movies, for example, The Sixth Sense, where people are embracing this into our culture and not aware of the truth. So if, if they're embracing it through the movies that they watch and through the things that they do and through, you know, the TV shows, how much easier is it going to be for Satan to deceive them in the last days with these very same things when it's already embedded in their culture? According to Jesus, the whole world would be deceived by this. All right, moving on to the last question for today. We're going to look at... um, All right, so the question is, Jesus called the unconscious state of the dead sleep in John chapter 11, verse 11 to 14. How long will these people sleep? We're going to look at Job chapter 14 and verse 12, and then 2 Peter 3 verse 10. So if someone wants to grab uh, Job chapter 14 verse 12. Job chapter 14 verse 12. No one else has it, I'll grab it. It says, So man lieth down and riseth not, till the heavens be no more. They shall not awake nor be raised out of their sleep. So according to Job uh, 14.12, it says, When a person 
goes down into the grave and they sleep, meaning death sleep, until the heavens be no more, they will not awake. Now remember, Jesus said, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot, one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law. So when is it exactly that heaven and earth pass away? How do we know, when, when will it be that heaven and earth has passed away? At the second coming of Christ. Yes, that's correct. Okay? If we look at 2 Peter 3.10, it tells us, but, that day, but the day of the Lord will come as a feast in the night in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. So the, earth, the, heaven and earth, the heavens and the earth pass away at the second coming of Jesus, the day of the Lord. And according to Job 14, 12, so man lies, lieth down and riseth not till the heavens be no more. They shall not awake nor be raised out of their sleep. So until the second coming, nobody gets out of the grave. That's the Bible speaking. And you know what? This makes a lot of sense when we look at what Jesus said about when people would raise up. So I just want to go to that, and that's the last thing we're going to talk about today. He was so clear on this text that I don't know what else he could have done to be more clear. This is in John chapter 6. Listen to what Jesus says here. For I came down from heaven... Not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will, which has sent me, that all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but shall raise it up again at the last day. When did Jesus say he was going to raise people up from the grave? At the last day, talking about his second coming. Verse 40. And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may, not, may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up. At the last day. The Jews then murmured at him because he said, I am the bread of life. Sorry, I am the bread which came down from heaven. And they said, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? And how is it then that he saith, I came down from heaven? Jesus therefore answered and said unto them, murmur not among yourselves. No man can, uh, can come to me except the father which has sent me. Draw him and I will raise him up. When? At the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught of God. Every man, uh, therefore, that hath heard and hath learned of the Father cometh unto me. Not that any man hath seen the Father, save he which is of God, he hath seen the Father. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers, which, uh, your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which, which cometh down from heaven, that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my, is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Then he goes on to say in verse 54, Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up. When? At the last day. So at least about six times, Jesus clearly stated that the resurrection will not take place until the last day. According to Job, nobody gets raised up out of the grave until the heavens pass away, which is, of course, the last day, the day of the Lord, the second coming. And so Jesus says at least six times in this text that no one is getting resurrected, but anyone who has faith in, who has faith in him will be raised up at the last day. So the dead do not come back from the grave until what Jesus calls the last day when he comes again. The dead have no knowledge of anything. They don't praise the Lord. They don't have hatred. They don't have envy. They don't have jealousy. They don't have thoughts. They don't have feelings. They don't have wisdom. They don't have knowledge. All of these things perish when a person goes into the grave. So the popular belief 
that people have had all these years that people live after you die or that they get reincarnated or something like that has been false. And it has been a deception of Satan because he has plans to deceive the whole world and he has the ability to do miracles and even impersonate these individuals so that people will believe that their dead loved ones and relatives can come back from the grave. And these deceptions are often positive experiences to the people who have them because they don't know that they're being deceived. But when we look at the Bible, we see that the soul is not immortal. It's a living person, not something that lives within a person. And we see that the spirit is actually better translated breath, and that when God made man, the combination of breath and body make the person a living human being. So according to the Bible, there's no such thing as an immortal spirit or an immortal soul. Uh, just to recap, the word ruach, which is translated either breath, uh, spirit, or um, it can mean like the Holy Spirit, or it can mean wind. If you look at the context carefully, you can tell which belongs in what place. So there are spiritual beings such as angels, which can sometimes be called spirits, which are uh, beings. There is the Holy Spirit, who is the third person in the Godhead. That's a spiritual being. But the word ruach can also be translated wind or breath, which is not a living thing, but rather um, something that God gives in combination with the body so that uh, it can live. When you step outside and you feel the wind blow on your face, the wind is not alive. It's just wind. So when God gives man in his nostrils the breath of life, he's giving him the ability to live as long as the combination of breath and body is together. There's no such thing as an immortal soul. So we're going to stop there, and we're going to pick up with the second part of this lesson um, next week. I want to thank you guys for coming, and uh, we'll just close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we've covered some difficult subject matter today, and there are many who may be hearing this message for the first time and who may be confused. We pray, Father, that your Holy Spirit would make it clear to them and help them to understand the truth about the state of the dead, that they would not be deceived by the spiritualism that is taking place in our world today. We pray, Father, that your Holy Spirit would make it clear, Lord, these deceptions that are taking place so that we can be prepared and ready for your soon coming rather than be deceived. Help us, Father, to put our faith and our trust in you and not in those who have familiar spirits. Help us, Father, to rely on you for the answers to all our questions and for the solving of all of our greatest problems. This we ask. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. So thank you guys for coming, and I uh, hope to see you next week. God bless.